going to introduce our next speaker. He is a very wise and spiritual soul, and he's also an archaeologist with years of research into investigating ancient civilizations and proving that they were here and proving that humans lived on this planet much longer than the history books tell us. Much, much longer, actually. You will know him as the Forbidden Archaeologist because of his amazing landmark best-selling book, Forbidden Archaeology. I also know him as a spiritual godbrother because we follow in the footsteps of the same great teacher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, who brought genuine Vedic studies and practice to the Western world. He is also an author and co-author of many books, including The Hidden History of Human Race and Human Devolution and My Science, My Religion. And they have the books in the, um, the um, exhibit room, so you have to go and see them. You can buy all his books there. He is a member of the World Archaeological Cong Congress and the European Association of Archaeologists and a research associate in history and philosophy of science for the Bhaktivedanta Institute. Today, we are going to learn about a great spiritual project of universal significance, the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, Dimensions of Spiritual Cosmology. Let's give a warm welcome to Michael Cremo. Okay, uh, thank you, Serena, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank all of you for coming to hear something about this project that I'm involved in, the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium. And I'm going to talk about the dimensions of spiritual cosmology. Okay. So... What is the Temple of Vedic Planetarium, and what is cosmology? The Temple of Vedic Planetarium is a cultural heritage preservation project. And what is it preserving? It's preserving the cosmology of an ancient wisdom tradition that comes out of India. Normally, we, we look as heritage having something to do with the past. You know, we take things that we find from the past, bring them into our present, and regard them as our heritage, our ancestry. <clears throat> but now, many archaeologists are directing their attention to the future, because just as people of the past have left wisdom and sacred objects to guide us in the present, we are also creating wisdom and sacred objects to leave to the future generations. So we're actually creating futures right now. And we should be trying to create the best futures that we can. Now, heritage exists in tangible and intangible form. By tangible heritage, I mean something like uh, the Taj Mahal, you know, some building, some structure, some physical object. Intangible heritage is just as important. That's the ideas, the philosophies, the worldviews, the songs, the stories passed down orally. You know, we've been talking a lot about the wisdom of the ancients. So that's, that's an intangible aspect of heritage. Now, the specific tradition that I'm interested in preserving the heritage of is called Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And a key personality in that wisdom tradition was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was an avatar of God. 
that appeared in 1486 at a place called Mayapur in West Bengal. So that is a very sacred place, Mayapur. <clears throat> and the teachings of Chaitanya especially stressed the book called the Srimad Bhagavatam, or the Bhagavat Purana. And this work is very interesting in that, wrong way. This book is very interesting in that it begins with a gathering of sages in the forest 5,000 years ago. And they are thinking, what are we going to leave as our heritage for the people of the coming age, which is going to be very difficult? We, you know, we've heard a lot about the cycles of time over the past couple of days. So, in this tradition, the cycles are called yugas, and we're about to enter, according to the traditional understanding, a very dark age of increasing social and environmental disturbance. And we see it happening around us. So they were wondering, what of all the Vedic truths of our vast store of wisdom, what are the most essential things to leave for future generations to help them get through this very difficult age. For a long time, for many hundreds and thousands of years, this traditional wisdom was the property of a specific group of people limited to the Indian subcontinent. But starting in 1965, a personality from that tradition came to the West and globalized this knowledge. <clears throat> and he, part of his plan for spreading knowledge of this ancient spiritual cosmology for the benefit of modern people was the temple of the Vedic planetarium. And he said it should be, this, the ideas of this cosmology should be presented in such a way that it's understandable to modern people. And I've benefited greatly in my work from studying aspects of this cosmology. So it's, as one of the speakers said, I heard, heard him say during the last couple of days, these ancient wisdom traditions, they're of interest to us, not simply as antiquarian artifacts, you know, some interesting ideas that are part of a dead civilization, Actually, it's a living cosmology that can benefit all of us. So this is the structure of the temple of the Vedic planetarium. Uh, that's not an artist's conception that actually exists in Mayapur and West Bengal right now. That's the physical structure of it. The, the part that I'm concerned with is the museum of the Vedic planetarium. And that will occupy the entire west wing of this structure. It'll be a museum with exhibits and films and virtual reality displays that will give people a kind of initiation into this 
cosmology. And we have to keep in mind that the, this is in a vortex. It's a sacred place where there's a lot of spiritual energy that's concentrated there. And in one sense, you could say this project will be like a portal for transcendence. So, so, just to give you an idea of what people will experience when they enter this place. As I said, the physical structure is there, and now I'm part of a group that's designing experiences and exhibits for the people who come there. And the first thing is when they enter, they'll go through a tunnel-like experience where all of the concerns that they have about having finding parking and getting to Mayapur from wherever they, they're coming from around the world or around India, all that will be put aside as they enter this space. And at the end of this tunnel experience, they come to a beautiful forest and they'll see the sages contemplating the welfare of the people of the coming age. Well, it's already arrived, it's beginning. So we'll have that experience. Then they go to the next level. And that level will be about how do we know things? I mean, there's people are putting out all kinds of knowledge today, but how reliable is that? And why should we look to ancient wisdom traditions for guidance? So this will be where people are introduced to the idea that there is a higher source of knowledge than that which is being provided to guide, or I should say misguide, human civilization today. Uh, of course, we've made a lot of progress through science and technology, but there's still huge problems because the way that they get knowledge isn't coming from the higher source. So Veda is a Sanskrit word that means knowledge, and it's not the property of any sectarian group. It's the legacy of humanity. So a cosmology is meant to answer three fundamental questions. Who am I? Where am I? Where should I be going? And we will take people on a journey through these things. Today, we're being told, if we, we ask a scientist, who are we? Many today will say, well, we're machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. And you're just a machine made of matter, really. And as far as consciousness is concerned, well, if you organize the matter in the brain in a sufficiently complex way, it generates what we call consciousness, but only temporarily. You know, at the time of death, when the chemicals in the brain become disorganized, no more consciousness, nothing really. So, 
we're providing a different answer to those questions, which I'll get to in a minute. Where am I? I'm in an accidental universe that was the result of some fluctuation of the quantum mechanical vacuum. And somehow or other, the planets and stars were formed, the chemical elements, the chemical elements began randomly interacting with each other, and somehow we get some first living thing, and then it mutates and evolves until we get human beings. Uh, so that's where we are. We're in the world of matter, and that's all there is to it. And where should I be going? Well, you just try to produce and consume as much as you can for as long as you're alive, and then it's all over. Game over. So level two of the six different levels, floors of this uh, display, will we'll deal with that first question. Who am I? And we want to give people the message that they are not machines made of matter. They are conscious, personal, individual selves that are completely different from the bodily vehicle made of matter that they occupy. And they will also learn that the conscious self in this material body, which is a temporary vehicle for the soul, will, at the time of death, transmigrate to another body, either human or of some other species, depending upon their level of consciousness. And we intend to give people the experience of being in a different body. Uh, you know, there are visual technologies that allow us to do that. And we also want to give insight that within every living thing, there is a soul, and it's worthy of respect. Today, we're not very respectful even of other human beings. You know, we kill, murder, destroy, and especially for things that, that are from the plant and the animal kingdom, we don't have very much respect for them at all. So one of the aspects of the wisdom of the ancients was they respected the earth, they respected the living things that were there, and also other human beings. Now, th there is a, a trend, in, even in the academic world, to post-humanism, which can be described as the questioning of anthropocentrism and the ontological divide between humans and non-humans. So this cosmology accomplishes that because a person who understands that there's the same kind of conscious self in every type of body will not be anthropocentric. So who are we? According to this tradition, Aham Brahmasmi, I'm an individual, eternal, personal, conscious self, a soul in a material body.
I mean, many scientists today claim that, no, you're not a soul. You're a byproduct of chemicals interacting in the brain. But nobody has ever shown how that could happen, how matter could generate consciousness. Consciousness has its own independent existence apart from the brain, apart from the body. And this is supported by medical evidence of out-of-body experiences and past life memories where people recall lives not only in other human bodies, but in bodies of other, other species. But among the bodies, the human body is particularly valuable because in it, we can ask and answer these questions and act upon that knowledge and communicate it to others. So then we go to the level three where we look at the question, where am I? And according to this cosmology, we're in the material universes which form only part of a larger spiritual cosmos where conscious selves exist in a world beyond birth and death. So that material universe, which is a small part of the total cosmos, is like a virtual reality, a simulated world But it's also an opportunity for the conscious self to elevate its understanding and qualify itself to exist on the timeless level of the realm of pure consciousness. Now, today, many are materialists, but some of them are starting to recognize that even matter is not passive, it has agency. And they call this the new materialism. So, in this ancient wisdom tradition that comes out of India, this is recognized. For example, the Bhagavad Gita says, although one falsely thinks one is the doer, the material energy by the modes is doing everything. And as far as matter having agency, in the Vedic tradition, matter personified is the goddess Kali, the material energy. And she can deal in a very harsh way with some of the materialists. So we want to uh, present different aspects of the Vedic cosmology, how it regards the different planetary systems within the material universe. And we want to give people an experience of something that can't be seen by instruments like the telescope. But if one has a vision that is cleansed and purified by different techniques of meditation and yoga, one can get a vision of the personality behind this, this universe. According to this cosmology, there are millions of universes. Mahavishnu lies on the causal ocean, and he's sleeping. He's in yoga nidra trance. And when he breathes, out, millions of universes expand from his body. And when he breathes in, 
the universes are absorbed into him, and all the souls that are in within those different universes, they go into a state of suspended animation until he breathes out again. And that breath lasts about trillions, several trillion years. So, if you want to know where we are, we're in one of those universes. And we'll be here for some time unless we use the portal to ascension and ascend to that level of pure consciousness. And another thing we'll try to communicate to people is the idea of cyclical time, which has a, a Vedic manifestation in terms of yugas. We'll discuss the, the yuga cycles. And one thing we want people to be able to do is to conceive of the universe as a body of God. Because in the ancient wisdom traditions all over the world, people understood that the universe, nature, is divine. But we don't see it like that today. And therefore, we just think it's there for us to exploit the resources of in an unsustainable way. Like if I go into somebody's house and they say, okay, here's my house, stay here for the weekend, and you just forget that it's somebody else's house and you start making long distance phone calls on their phones and you know destroying everything and consuming everything because you don't appreciate it belongs to somebody. So we want to give them the vision of seeing the universal form, which is the universe as a form of God. So the Level four will deal with where should we be going? We've learned, okay, we are conscious selves, but we're now in the world of matter. That's where we are. Where should we be going? We should be ascending through the portals that are offered to us to that level of pure consciousness beyond all the cycles of, of time. So that's what will be the subject of level four of this experience. And it's kind of interesting. This is the, the dome part of the West Wing. You know, there are five floors, and then there's this um, and this will be the levels of the cosmos. People will be going around experiencing the different levels of the cosmos. At the bottom is the material level, and then beyond that is the Brahma Jyoti, the realm of pure light. And there is the abode of Shiva, who prevents people who are very materialistic from entering the spiritual world. And then there's the level of Vaikuntha, 
where God is present in a form that is worship in awe and reverence. Because this is a conception that some people have of God as being like a great king that has to be obeyed like that. So there's a place for such people. It's in Vaikuntha where God displays his, when I say his, I, I should say his and her, because according to the, this cosmology, God exists in male and female form. And sometimes we wonder, how did this male, female, and other gender thing, uh, how did that get started? Because according to material science, the first living thing was asexual. <clears throat> It's a single cell creature that just divided, made the same copy. It's a big mystery how that male-female thing started. But according to this cosmology, everything we observe on this level of reality is a reflection of a higher truth that's existing on that level. So there, but they're, they're treated like a king and queen, and they're, they're worshipped, they're served, and that is one type of experience that's possible for someone to have on that level of pure consciousness. But there are other types of experience that it's possible to have. Um, these experiences, these emotional Experiences are called rasas, or relationships. And one of them is friendship. Some people, the most important person in their life is their best friend, their BFF, best friend forever. <clears throat> that, some people really relish that type of experience. They love their friend. They'll do anything for their friend. But sometimes when their friend says something they don't like, they'll say, hey, let's stop that. So on the spiritual level of reality, there are souls that relate to God like that. God is their friend, they are God's friend, and if they play a game and the friend wins over his other friend, God, then God will recognize it. In other words, there's no awe and reverence. There's no worship. You don't worship your friend. And then beyond that, some people, the, the most significant relationship in their lives is their child, their son, their daughter. And again, they take a superior role. So it's possible for a soul to have that kind of relationship with God eternally. And the difference between that relationship and the relationships that we uh, have in this world is that the one on the spiritual level never ends. The child never grows up and goes away. Uh, the parent is always there. Nothing ever happens to it, to the parent. Uh, that's another possible relationship. And then, then there's Madhurya Rasa, the loving relationship as an unmarried lover. It's possible to have that kind of relationship with God. As I said, everything we have 
in terms of relationships on this level of reality is a reflection of an eternal type of relationship that it's possible to have. Now in the Vaikuntha world, where God is worshipped in awe and reverence as the supreme, there is a relationship of married love, husband and wife, that goes on eternally between God and the soul that plays that role. But on the topmost level, it's unmarried love, which is very intense. It's the most intense type of emotional experience, especially if there's separation between the lover and the beloved. We find a reflection of this in Christianity. Um, there are saints who claim to be the bride of Jesus or in the Psalms, in the Bible, they have Solomon praying to God like a lover prays or thinks about a, the beloved. So the ultimate experience in this cosmology is love of God. That's what the conscious self is ultimately meant to experience. But to uh, get to that level, there's a process. And part of it is to experience these things gradually, step by step. And to do that, it's necessary to practice some spiritual discipline. And part of that spiritual discipline is to go to these sacred places, uh, whether it's in this tradition or some other. But we wanted to preserve these concepts because they're worthy of people's contemplation. And by practicing yoga, meditation, contemplation, prayer, or some other spiritual discipline, one can learn to experience the happiness within. And it's only by getting that higher taste that one can give up attachment to other things. So, uh, you know, I've been to Mayapur. I was just there a few weeks ago, spent about a month there. And when you're there, somebody else mentioned just a few minutes ago that, you know, it's like you're kind of swept off your feet by the spiritual energy of the place. It's like you're in a spiritual jacuzzi, you know, just being spun around. Uh, it's actually pretty amazing. And that, that can be experienced in many different sacred places. And I think this basic philosophy can really help because it's based on ahimsa, nonviolence. And that's good for the earth, it's good for other living things. So that's kind of the esoteric and exoteric purpose of this Temple of Vedic Planetarium project in this sacred place, Mayapur, in West Bengal, India. So uh, when we open the museum, I hope some of you will come um, to the Museum of the Vedic Planetarium. Uh, these are some of my books which are available 
on the book table in the exhibit area. The, they will also be here tomorrow, 5 to 7 p.m., when I'm going to be giving a workshop on uh, science meets the Vedas, where I'm going to be discussing what light that the Vedic cosmology sheds on different fields of science. Like I've done a lot of work in archaeology, so I'll explain how that relates. And then we'll consider other scientific questions as well. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to, I mean, it's a big hall here. It's actually going to be held here, but I think there are not going to be a, as many people, so there'll be more of a chance to interact and, and discuss these things. So thank you very much. Thank you.